Welcome, welcome to everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's really a pleasure to have all of you here in this webinar. On behalf of Raf Snack, the first deputy reporter general of IPPI and responsible of the standing committee of traditional knowledge, connected resources, and cultural expressions, we want to express our gratitude firstly for all of you to attend this event also to ACP, because with this, in the framework of the collaboration agreement with those association, this is the second successful webinar series we have performed. Last year, we focused on an agenda in Latin America, and this year on the European Union. But this is possible because we have the collaboration of the committee members of APPI who uh, de designed the program, especially thanks to Flor Tunising and Silvia Tudorova, who has devoted a lot of time preparing this agenda, again, focus on Europe, but also is the result of the teamwork with ACP and the participants, either the speakers, or as in this case, Otto Williams as the moderator of this uh, webinar, which is the last one of this series of four webinars. As you remember, the first two were oriented to genetic resources, with the interesting participation of Flor Tunisin and Daphne Mendes of Peru, as well as with uh, the other members from Silva Torova and Ivana Kunta from Croatia, Bulgaria and Croatia. In the last webinar, in the second part, we talk about the intersection of IP and cultural heritage with a very interesting participation of Lili Martinet from the cultural heritage uh, officer of the French government and Professor Luigi Perugi from the UNESCO. They provide us a very interesting scenario about the uh, perspective of cultural heritage from the UNESCO perspective. Uh, and now we will have this last webinar with the participation of very distinguished speakers that also want to appreciate and thanks to WIPO because it has been very supportive with this organization of the two series of, of webinars. And it's especially important because as you may know, there are ongoing discussions in WIPO in, according to the mandate of the Intergovernmental Committee, if possible to achieve a diplomatic conference. But also because, and we, you are already invited to participate in the APPI Congress in Istanbul on October, in which we will have a panel about these topics. Provi Concerning what was going on worldwide, the discussions in the draft of international instrument, but also what has an impact in different regions of the world. So thanks again for being here, and also I have I appreciate the participation of our colleague and friend Matthias Nottinger from ACP, who has been quite again supportive on this event. Matthias, the floor is yours. Good morning. Uh, so I'm here just to to give a few words in. Uh, representing a CP. Um, first, I want to to tell everyone, and especially the, the AP, APPI authorities, that we are very happy with uh, the result of this cooperation. As Martin said, it started with uh, the signing of a cooperation agreement um, last year in the in, in APPI's Congress in in San Francisco, and it, it was uh, uh, really a, a very successful. And, and we are very happy because. Uh, sometimes the cooperation agreement between the the associations, uh, the associations as a CPI and PPI, sometimes are expressions of uh, of good intentions, but they never get to to specific results. In this case, um, not not only the both associations have cooperated uh, through sending uh, you know uh, authorities and people to to each one each 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 of one's uh, uh, congresses and events and doing very successful and fruitful meetings, but also uh, by the organization of these two series of four webinars each. Uh, and I thank you, Martin, for the initiative. I know you have been a, a key, uh, your, 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 your role has been a key uh, to this organization, the, the organization of this series. Uh, and also, of course, Ralph uh, Nack and, and Cynthia from AIPPI for, for their support and, and, the, and promoting um, these, these activities. So I'm, I'm, I mean, as I said, we are we are very happy. As as you mentioned, last year we had 
a series of four webinars which were focused in Latin America, about, I mean, uh, covering uh, traditional knowledge, uh, genetic resources, and, um, and cultural expressions and cultural heritage. Uh, we had panelists from, from Peru, Guatemala, Panama, Brazil, uh, Costa Rica, Colombia, Mexico. And we had, of course, uh, moderators from the IPPI. And this year, we had four events which were more focused on the European frame, uh, legal framework uh, for genetic resources, cultural expressions, and heritage, uh, and uh, with, with um, experts from, from Japan, from Peru, Amsterdam, uh, Netherlands, Brazil, Bulgaria, it, Italy, uh, France, WIPO, um, uh, and as you say, Croatia and the University of Sofia. Uh, so we are, uh, and, and in this case, uh, our, our experts from SCP contributed from the moderating side. Thank you, Audrey, who's participating now. Daphne Ramos in the, in the previous one, and, and Aldo Fabrizio Modica uh, also in one of the one of the events. So uh, again, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for participating. It's uh, uh, the good thing about this this type of activities that people participate and and take advantage of of the efforts and the initiatives of, of, of the organizers, the moderators and the panelists. Thank you everyone for the efforts and thank you very much EIPPI for, for this cooperation. Thank, thank, thank you, Matthias. And now we have a very uh, good uh, moderator who has been working very hard in the committee of ACP, but also in IPPI. And she's quite enthusiastic and very supportive on these topics. And she's Audrey Williams. Uh, she is the, the founder partner of a leading IP law firm, Studio Benedetti, where she served as a co-managing partner and head of the anti-partisan litigation department. She graduated in law and political science from Universidad Santa Maria La Antigua, Panama, with magna cum laude distinction. She completed studies in the American legal system at Georgetown University and obtained an LLM from Bold Hall School Law, University of California at Berkeley, both as Fulbright Scholarship recipients. Among her experience of 30 years of experience uh, in litigation matters and counterfeiting and copyright, she has served as Assistant Secretary, Secretary and Vice President of the Panamanian Association of IP, and is a president of the APPI National Group. She also is an active member in other associations and very supportive and a key element in either ACP in IPPI in this topic. Audrey, thank you so much. The floor is yours and enjoy this webinar. Thank you so much, Martin. Um, very glad. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm very glad to be participating in this last uh, webinar of the AIPPI and ACP webinar series on traditional knowledge, generic resources, and traditional cultural expressions under the European legal framework and perspective. Today, we are having the second part of the webinar entitled Intersection of Intellectual Property, Cultural Heritage, and Traditional Cultural Expressions, TCEs, under the, from a European perspective. Our lead, our, our speakers will provide an overview of the ongoing discussions at WIPO regarding the protection of PCEs and, and, and a draft of an international instrument to protect it. They will also share a study case of the Horizon Arachnid Project advocating the role of silk art and cultural heritage at national and European scale. Uh, before starting, we have some housekeeping details to go through. So uh, for you to know, there, there will be a Q&A session at the end of all presentations. Questions to the speakers should be submitted via the Q&A function. For technical problems, please send a message via the chat function to AIPPI events. For recording, and the recording and the slides from today will be available upon request to events at AIPPI.org. Translation will be available also from English to Spanish and Spanish to English. At the end, there is a brief survey 
and we would like you to participate to have your feedback, which will be very much appreciated. Um, I have the pleasure to introduce now our great speakers today in the order they will be presenting. presenting. First, uh, Daphne Sograpos Johnson, Senior Legal Officer in the Traditional Knowledge Division of the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO. She has 20 years of experience researching and working in the area of intellectual property, traditional knowledge, and traditional cultural expressions. Prior to joining WIPO, Daphne was a lecturer in intellectual property law at the University of Reading in the UK and a visiting lecturer in trademark law at King's College London and Queen Mary University of London. Daphne holds an LLM in intellectual property from University College London and a PhD from Queen Mary. Her thesis focused on the use of existing intellectual property rights to protect traditional cultural expressions. Daphne has been coordinating the WIPO training, mentoring, and matchmaking program on intellectual property for women, women entrepreneurs from indigenous peoples and local communities, and mentoring participants since 2019. She's also the head tutor of WIPO's advanced course on intellectual property, traditional knowledge, and traditional cultural ex expressions. And we also have today Silvia Capelota, Research Manager at Council for Agricultural Research and Economics Research Central Agriculture and Environment in Italy and responsible of the Laboratory of Sericulture of Padua for the same institution. She is supervisor of the two sericultural germplasm banks, Silkworm and Mulberry, for the Italian Ministry of Agriculture. She is coordinator of the European project Arachne, advocating the role of silk art and cultural heritage at national and European scale from the Horizon Europe program called Research and Innovation on Cultural Heritage and Cultural Cre and Creative Industries. She has 30 years experience in silkworm rearing and mulberry cultivation. So um, now, Daphne, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Audrey, for the kind introduction. And my thanks also to AIPPI and to SCP for inviting me to participate in this webinar. It's really, really a, a great pleasure. And I look forward to uh, talking with all of you about the interse intersection between intellectual property and cultural heritage or traditional cultural expressions. Uh, so I think I'm going to start by sharing my screen. I have some slides. Um, there we go. Yes, so I hope that you can all see uh, my screen. And um, what um, I'll try and do today is, is first put um, cultural heritage and traditional cultural expression in perspective um, in the context of intellectual property and um, discuss some of the legal issues that arise when one considers protection of cultural expressions with intellectual property. I'm going to talk, uh, as uh, Oji announced, about the, the, um, the current ongoing negotiations in WIPO for an international legal instrument that would provide protection for traditional cultural expressions, um, traditional knowledge, and genetic resources. And also talk a little bit and give some examples as to, you know, the fact that despite the fact that there may be gaps in protection, um, one can still use some of the existing intellectual property rights in in, in some interesting ways. And this will be, a, a, I think, a nice um, link also with uh, Sylvia's presentation later on. And, and finally, and I hope there'll be time for that, uh, I wanted to talk about some uh, practical mechanisms that can be used in support um, of normative, normative initiatives as well. So um, to get us started then, um, 
traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions um, are the subject matter that uh, we work here in WIPO in the traditional knowledge division. And uh, I'm not going to pretend to give a definitions for traditional knowledge or cultural expressions, but perhaps just uh, to put us back in context, uh, just to give some working descriptions so we can say that traditional cultural expressions are the various forms in which traditional knowledge and culture are expressed. And they can really be many different things. They can be tangible, they can in be intangible, they can be mixed. And every community in the various countries and region, they will have a different understanding as to what their cultural expressions are. And that's why it's quite difficult to provide a definition for them at the international level. But they can be symbols, crafts, songs, performances, names, designs, works of architecture. They can really be many different things. And traditional knowledge, on the other hand, is the more perhaps technical aspect of, of, the, of, the, of cultural heritage. Uh, and basically it can be described as the knowledge which results from intellectual activity in a traditional context. And so that can include um, know-how, skills, practices, learnings, and it's not going to be limited to a specific field. So you can have traditional knowledge linked to uh, genetic resources. So that's going to tell you how to use genetic resources to have, um, uh, you know, uh, a useful outcome. Or traditional knowledge linked to the climate change, or to agriculture, or to to other different things. So here again we're not limited to a specific technical field. But in any case, so we have the, these descriptions of TK and TCEs, but what's very important from a, an IP perspective is to keep in mind the very specific characteristics of um, traditional cultural expressions and traditional knowledge. And they're both traditional. And what does that mean? So it means that they are handed down from generation to generation. Um, so there is an element of time when we think of TK and TCEs, but this does not mean that they are stuck in time because within a community, they're constantly evolving, developing, they're being recreated within that community. But the time element is an element that for us IP lawyers creates a little bit of a difficulty then they reflect the community's cultural and social identity. And they're often made by unknown authors. So as that's particularly the case for what we call the underlying cultural expressions, the underlying traditional knowledge, the ones that have been around for a long time, the styles of expression, for example. Because of course we can distinguish those from contemporary cultural expressions where we do know who the author is in many in many uh, cases, but the, the underlying one, sometimes we don't know who the original author was, and they're seen as belonging to a community under customary law, or the community is seen as being the custodian of those cultural expressions and of that traditional knowledge. Now, there's no doubt that traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions our intellectual property because they are creations of the human mind, right? So they do fit within the definition of intellectual property, but because of the fact that they are traditional and, and because of these characteristics that I, I just described a moment ago, sometimes they cannot be fully protected by the existing IP systems. So what we say is that there are gaps in the protection uh, provided by the existing IP systems. And and we can find many examples of those. So for example, if you want to protect um, a traditional work with copyright, you need the works needs to be original. Uh, you need to know who the author is so that you can vest the rights uh, to a specific author. And if you don't know who the author is, then you know you cannot, um, you know, you don't know who has the copyright. Um, and, and then the IP rights are also time limited, right? Some of these cultural expressions have been around for, for quite some time. So um, from the conventional IP rights perspective, they would sometimes be seen perhaps as being in the public domain. And we can do the same analysis with the other IP rights, right? So for example, if we have a traditional 
um, symbol. You could protect it by uh, trademarks, but you need to have uh, you need to be using it in the course of trade. And for um, symbols that are sacred or secret, communities won't want to use them in the course of trade. And it would be very hard to, to register all, all indigenous symbols anyway. It would be very costly. So you can, you can protect some things, but you won't get a full protection with the existing IP rights. And that's why we say that there are these gaps in, in the protection that's provided by the existing IP system. And so, um, you know, when work started on uh, and the international uh, community started being, uh, you know, more aware of the need for protection and, you know, uh, work started on this and some countries started considering ways to protect traditional cultural expressions. Basically, you know, they soon realized that there was this gap in the protection and the two options they had was either to adapt the existing IP system. So to say, okay, so our copyright, trademark, patent laws, they're not perfect. They do provide some protection. There are gaps. So what we're going to do is we're going to adapt those existing IP laws to take into account this specific subject matter. And um, this has, um, you know, we've seen adaptations of, of um, copyright law in many countries where um, traditional cultural expression was recognized as part of subject matter of, um, of copyright. We've seen um, adaptations of trademark laws, like for example, in New Zealand, where um, in the trademark registration process, if a trademark that was being applied for contained um, Maori uh, names or symbols, then a specific committee would examine it and if they found it was offensive to the Maori, they would refuse registration. So, so that's all better. But in that specific example, you know, if the trademark was not offensive and if the person who was applying for the registration was not a Maori, then that was still fine and they could still register the trademark. And even though, yeah, it's better because we can prevent the registration of offensive marks, still it's not a, 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 a you know, it's not an optimal uh, system from the perspective of providing the full protection to TKMTC. And so what a lot of countries and regional organizations started considering and doing was the adopted of what we call, the adoption of what we call sui generis regimes. And this is to create a new IP law. So it's an IP law that functions like the other IP laws. You can identify the subject matter, um, you're going to say who should benefit. You're going to define the scope of the rights and also the exceptions. So we have exclusive rights, exceptions, this balance that we find in the IP system and in, in all the, the other IP laws would be present. That's a sui generis system. But these regimes would specifically aim to protect TK, t, uh, traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expression. So, so on the slide, you can see on the top right image, um, we have a, a database on the WIPO website if you're interested to look at some of these sui generis and adapted IP regimes, you can find many examples actually. Um, and, and at the international level, uh, WIPO member states established the WIPO Intergovernmental Committee on Intellectual Property and Genetic Resources, Traditional Knowledge and Folklore, and this title, you will agree, is a bit long, so we call it the IGC in short. And the IGC was created in, in 2000, and basically it's a forum where negotiations take place for an international legal instrument to protect TKTCs and genetic resources. So who comes to the IGC? We have the member states of WIPO, of course, but also, and very importantly, representatives of indigenous peoples and local communities. We have um, business um, representatives, we have civil society, there are many NGOs. So, um, so all these people meet uh, regularly for the meetings of the IGC to work on the draft legal instruments. Now on traditional knowledge and traditional culture expressions, there are currently two draft texts in front of the IGC. So there are draft articles on TK and draft articles on traditional cultural expressions. And I'm not gonna reproduce any of these articles today, but I'm, I'm just gonna 
talk to you about them in 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 general way in a general manner so um both of these draft legal instruments follow a similar structure and they both address a number of key issues and i've reproduced these key issues on on the slide and the ones in bold are the ones that are particularly important um, and are some of the really the central issues first one being why protect so what are the objectives of protection of tk and tces then comes what to protect that the subject matter and it may seem straightforward but like defining what is a straightforward what, what is a subject matter is not necessarily an easy task again be, because of the difference of perception of what cultural expressions might be from one community or country to the other then we have the beneficiaries and the, there is by and large agreement that indigenous peoples and local communities should benefit should be the beneficiaries of this protection but according to some member states there could be also other beneficiaries uh, in addition to indigenous peoples and local communities then comes the scope of protection this is one of the central provisions what acts should be forbidden what should be the scope of protection um, of exclusive rights granted to the beneficiaries and for those of you who are not familiar with the negotiations and with the IGC on the scope of protection one interesting tendency for a number of years now has been to say that there should be um, a differentiated approach to the sco scope of protection so it's like a tiered approach to protection meaning that we distinguish between different types of cultural expressions and different types of traditional knowledge and depending on the type of tk or tce the beneficiaries would have a different type of scope of protection so for example um traditional cultural expressions that are um sacred in nature that have a particular uh, cultural significance for communities will get the highest scope of protection that could go for example the right to oppose any use by third parties and other types of cultural expressions or traditional knowledge that are uh, widely available that a lot of people know about that have been well documented um, it's a different category and uh, the types of the type of scope of protection could be something softer something more similar to more rights for example like a paternity right or something like that so this is like the tiered or differentiated approach to scope of protection and then like in all the ip laws there is there are exceptions and limitations and a number of other um, uh, key questions also would be addressed like should there be sanction and penalties how will the rights be managed for how long uh, should there be formalities that means should someone register a cultural expression um, for example with the ip office for it to be protected so the tendency is to say no <laughs> Um, but it's a question and then other questions like should the rights be retrospective and how will foreign right holders be treated because here we're in the context of an international instrument so obviously these these questions um, uh, apply here All right so as I said um, the IGC deals with three areas of subject matter so we have traditional knowledge, cultural expressions, and genetic resources. So I haven't talked much of genetic, re genetic resources yet, but um, uh, an important development regarding genetic resources is that uh, during the 2022 WIPO General Assembly of the Member States, the GA decided, uh, that was in July uh, last year actually, decided to convene a diplomatic conference to conclude an international legal instrument relating to intellectual property, genetic resources, and traditional knowledge that is associated with genetic resources. Right? So this genetic resources and associated uh, traditional knowledge has been separated in a way and has been considered by member states that it was mature enough to go 
to a diplomatic conference. And the diplomatic conference is the way by which the member states of WIPO would um, adopt an international uh, treaty, for example. So the member states took that decision and they also said that the diplomatic conference should take place no later than 2024. So it will be next year at some point. We don't have uh, dates yet. Um, uh, the diplomatic conference will be based inter alia on the chair's text. So the chair of the IGC ha has uh, has um, prepared what we call a chair's text with a proposal uh, for the specific articles. And then in the run up to the gen to the diplomatic conference, so that will be later this year, we're going to have an IGC spe special session on genetic resources and a preparatory committee in the second half of 2023. And so these are both scheduled for September. So the special session will take place from September 4 to 8 here in Geneva. And the PREPCOM, the preparatory committee, will take place uh, back to back with uh, the other one uh, on September 11 to 13. So uh, these will be coming soon. Now, th this is like what I wanted to say about the work of the IGC and the normative work at the international level. And I'll be happy to uh, provide more information if someone has questions during the, the, the Q&A. But um, I, I still wanted to come back to the use of existing IP rights, and especially in the context of tradition-based community enterprises. So all the, the community businesses, the community enterprise that are based on traditional knowledge, traditional culture expressions. Why it is important for them to consider using traditional um, conventional intellectual property rights uh, for their businesses. And so generally speaking, for these businesses, they're usually SMEs and like with other SMEs that deal with you know, non-traditional products, IP plays a key role to help community-based businesses to build stronger and more competitive businesses. So they're very, very important. And some of the, the common objectives of tradition-based businesses um, are, are the following, and this is by no means an exhaustive list, right? And, and of course, you're gonna have commercial benefits being an objective of why a community should start a community-based enterprise or an, an individual indigenous entrepreneur should start a business that is uh, based on, on, on cultural heritage or traditional cultural expression. So commercial benefits are, are of course a motivator, but there are other concerns as well and other objectives that they may have. And some of them important ones could be recognition, uh, preservation of traditional ways. Uh, a concern of a lot of the indigenous entrepreneurs that we work with and we support here in WIPO is that, and, and that was the case, especially in the context of the COVID pandemic, younger generations, um, they're, they're you know, they're moving on, like they, they, they lose the interest sometimes in learning the traditional ways, the know-how is getting lost. And there's this feeling that if, um, you know, um, one can show the younger generations that there is uh, an interest in, in, in having um, tradition-based businesses that they can make a living out of it. And in a way it also preserves the traditional ways. This is an important element. So preservation of traditional ways, socioeconomic development within the community, of course. And, and one of the concerns and also um, motivator for the use of intellectual property rights will be protection against misappropriations, having the tools to protect uh, one's uh, cultural uh, heritage and one's uh, tradition-based business against misappropriation. Now, I've, uh, for the next few slides, I've just included some, some examples really of, um, of how um, IP can support uh, contemporary artists or uh, tradition-based uh, you know, current businesses. And, and the first one uh, here that I have is copyright. And we did say that in the beginning, because of the fact that we're talking about traditional cultural expressions, 
um, sometimes we cannot identify the, the author of the underlying TCE and the underlying TCE won't be protectable by by um, intellectual property or, or copyright here. And that's the case with styles of doing something. So for example, and, and this, I'm sure most people will be able to, to relate to that because Aboriginal art is so well known and is so beautiful. So um, Aboriginal people have this style of painting, which is a dot style painting. It's a little bit like the ones I have reproduced on on the slide and like the dot style painting it's a style you cannot protect this by copyright we don't know who started painting in that style but in any case copyright protects against exact copies right but for contemporary indigenous artists where they did a painting themselves that's not a copy of something else and we can identify them and here i have the beautiful art artwork on the slide of of jenny Petiare. And, um, you know, obviously they should be aware of their IP rights, even though it's tradition based works, it's works that are fully protectable by conventional intellectual property rights. The other example comes in the, um, in, in the, in the area of like promoting and distinguishing um, works in, in the marketplace. And when uh, like um, a tradition based business, um, a business based on cultural heritage will uh, sort of like uh, look to promote and to brand their goods, they have a number of options from an IP perspective. And we have the range of trademarks, collective marks, certification marks, geographical indications, right? And they're all similar from the perspective that they look to inform the consumer about the origin of the goods and services and sometimes also convey information about the quality or other uh, yeah, characteristics of the goods, right? Um, it, it's quite important. This is a part as part of a branding strategy. An IP strategy is really critical for all businesses, including indigenous businesses, but making the right informed decision as to the pros and cons of these tools is very important. Having the tools to do so is also quite important. And actually some of these tools like collective and certification marks are particularly appropriate in the community context because they can be used by a collective. And um, perhaps this also reduced the price for the individual uh, users, but together they can also get stronger by using each using the certification marks or the collective marks together, they build the awareness of um, these uh, these um, signs in the minds of, of the consumer. And so there's a great example that comes from uh, Northern Europe, uh, from Scandinavia, where the Sami people um, live. And uh, this is a certification mark that is called Sami Joji. It was registered in 1980. It went through a phase of, um, at some point, um, reclarification re of some of um, its it, it, um, its regulation, and also it was given a new um, a, a new um, I don't know how you say um, um, yeah a new spirit like uh, not too long ago. And basically, this certification mark communicates the reputation and quality of the genuine Sami handicraft. So we have a message of quality and authenticity, and it also helps to distinguish uh, Sami handicrafts in the marketplace. So this is a very, very good example. And I have one that is around design law that I really, really like, and it comes from Kyrgyzstan. So in Kyrgyzstan, we have nomadic um, communities. Um, and, um, you know, they, uh, they, they travel with the horses and they live in yurts and they build these yurts in, you know, so fast and so effectively have witnesses, it's really amazing. And the yurts are part of their cultural heritage. And um, they did this campaign, which was aimed at the tourist industry in Kyrgyzstan. And I thought it was really clever because they... Uh, prepared a little, and you can see it here, actually I have one here. It's really small like that. 
and it's a little kit to build your yards, right? So it's a bit like a Lego and it's got instructions inside it. And I did it with my daughter and we really, it took us two hours, I have to say, but we had fun. And so it, it, it's a really, really clever marketing thing, right? Because it gives us a message about the cultural heritage and it's a way to build on the cultural heritage to do something new. And in addition to being a great idea, from an IP perspective, they were also very clever because they registered, they, they, they applied and got a registered design for the, the actual uh, yurt, the, the, the mini yurt. They registered uh, trademarks and a slogan. So uni yurt was a trademark and think no, but is a slogan also that goes with it. And in addition to that, they, they had a great um, digital storytelling strategy. Because of course, we all know that IP rights are great and you get an IP right and it's a good first step. But as part of the branding strategy, you need to know how you're gonna use your IP right with the right tools. So you need to, to be agile now with social media, with digital storytelling, with marketing and so on. So altogether, I thought that was like a great, um, great, great example that, that I really liked and uh, wanted to share with you. And then we have one in the area of geographical indications. And I know that in Latin America, there are many geographical indications linked to handicrafts products. And, you know, for example, in Colombia, they have like, I think 12 geographical indications for, for handicrafts and, and that's amazing. But this, this, this example that I have comes from Ecuador. So it's about the Monte Cristi hat, which is also sometimes called the Panama hat. And here you can see that, and, and GI is, is sometimes a tool that a lot of people are keen to go for a GI, but it's a heavy tool, right? As, as compared to, to collective marks and, and um, certification marks. So there has to be the right infrastructure in the country. The producers need to be organized in the right way to be able to you know, define the specifications and so on. But when it works, it's great. And this is a good example that comes from, from Ecuador. And here we have the combination of the place of origin with the specific characteristics that are linked to natural elements. So the materials, these fibers that are used to the hat, but also human factors. And that's the know-how. That's the traditional knowledge as to how you're gonna do these, uh, actually weave uh, these natural uh, fibers and do these hats. And then the actual hat is a cultural expression. So we see how it all um, comes together. Right, so these are some of the examples I wanted to share. And uh, we have a number of resources um, in WIPO. They're all available um, in many languages on the WIPO website. And you can find if you're interested, like a lot more examples. Um, and then there are more materials and webinars and publications to look at if you're interested to to find out more. Um, now I'm going to ask our moderator how I'm doing with time. So I could stop here or talk a little bit about documentation, but Audrey, please tell me. Yeah, um, I think we, yeah, we, we ha have just a couple of minutes. Okay. So then I, I think, um, I think I'll stop here uh, in that case, but um, I'll be happy to talk about, um, you know, other, any, any of these in, in the Q&A and also to touch a little bit on documentation if there is an interest from the audience. So thank you very much everyone for your attention and uh, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Daphne, for such a enriching and excellent presentation. Uh, now uh, we have Sylvia. Sylvia, please go ahead with your presentation. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, now I will share my screen. Okay. This is the first. Okay. 
Okay, um, my presentation after the presentation of uh, Daphne uh, um, is uh, a study case of uh, what uh, she explained, uh, because uh, in fact, uh, um, behind uh, every um, uh, every uh, product, every uh, um, uh, production of the intellect of intellectual property there is a project a design and uh, uh, my story is the story of this design the story of a project uh, so i will show to you the study case of the arachne uh, project um, the Arachne project uh, um, uh, is uh, uh, a project from the European community and uh, the title is Advocating the Role of Silk Art and Cultural Heritage at the National and the European uh, Scale. And uh, why uh, this project uh, was born? Because the uh, European uh, uh, community uh, has uh, a, a big uh, um, uh, believe very much in uh, uh, building uh, the future uh, on the basis of the past. So that uh, we have uh, a, a part, a research program um, uh, where uh, culture, creativity and inclusive society are uh, very important and the um, uh, European cultural heritage is uh, a big part of this uh, uh, program. But this program uh, should uh, be based on a green uh, European cultural heritage because we are committed uh, to a green uh, future and to uh, face uh, the challenge, challenges of uh, um, uh, a green evolution of our society. Uh, so that it is important that our cultural heritage is uh, uh, exploited in a, a sustainable way and uh, uh, through the uh, urban and the rural uh, regeneration. And for, uh, to do it, uh, we should have uh, um, innovative restoration and conservation uh, technologies. And we should also go uh, through the, uh, the perspective of uh, a green transition. And this could be very useful also for uh, cultural and creative industries and arts, uh, and uh, can contribute to create uh, sustainable economic growth and job jobs. Uh, but uh, as Daphne explained before, we need to uh, narrate, uh, to have a storytelling, uh, so that we need uh, digital means. And uh, for this reason, uh, we should also um, uh, have cultural and creative industries committed uh, to uh, create uh, a new human-centered digital world about the cultural heritage uh, so that we can uh, um, have also innovation uh, to transmit our uh, European cultural heritage. And uh, um, in this way, uh, we can sustain uh, social cohesion and also we can engage uh, citizens, citizens and uh, sharing knowledge across society. This is very important in the Arachne project. I will show you later uh, how much our uh, project focus on uh, the contribution of uh, um, uh, local communities. Um, and this uh, approach uh, can uh, uh, allow uh, cultural and creative industries and uh, the arts uh, to represent the European uh, value, values in the world. Uh, we uh, want to protect our intellectual properties, but at the same time, we are very interested 
interested in promoting our uh, cultural heritage uh, abroad because the European community believe in uh, sharing values and in promoting values uh, abroad. Um, the European uh, community was one of the two driver of our uh, project, but the uh, other driver was the Council of Europe. The Council of Europe is uh, um, very, in, a very important organization and is the uh, continent leading human rights organization. And uh, uh, she uh, obtained two important uh, achievements in Europe. Uh, the first one is the Faro Convention. And the second one is the establishment of uh, cultural uh, itineraries. Uh, the Faro uh, Convention um, uh, has the um, aim of uh, recognizing that rights relating to cultural heritage are uh, inherent in the, right, in the right to participate in cultural life. Um, and, and this is defined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, so that uh, the uh, the rights related to cultural heritage are uh, treated as, are considered as human rights. This is very important in this convention. Uh, but also um, uh, this, uh, um, this convention says that uh, everyone alone or collectively has the responsibility to respect the cultural heritage of others as much as they own heritage and consequently the common heritage of Europe. This is also a very important, uh, um, uh, a very important uh, achievement for uh, Europe because on the base of this achievement, we can share our common heritage and then we can build a common identity of Europe. And of course, uh, if we have a common identity, we can collaborate on, on uh, uh, some teams. Uh, uh, and also we can uh, um, live uh, in a friendship and in peace. That is one of the aim, aims of uh, the uh, Council of uh, Europe. Uh, the second achievement of the um, uh, program of the Council of Europe uh, is the uh, program about uh, uh, cultural roads. The cultural roads are uh, uh, itinerary, uh, cultural itineraries, uh, and they were launched by the Council of Europe uh, um, about uh, uh, 40 years ago. And they uh, demonstrate uh, uh, through a journey in, spa in space and time how the heritage of the different countries and culture of Europe uh, contributes to a shared and living cultural heritage. They are uh, now they are about uh, uh, 40 uh, cultural routes and they attract uh, a lot of tourists that uh, could uh, um, leave the um, European values, the European um, uh, uh, cultural heritage and can learn our uh, uh, common uh, values. They uh, go through different uh, uh, countries in Europe. Uh, they should be uh, prepared uh, by an association. This association is made of several countries and they, are, uh, uh, they uh, should uh, undergo to uh, a very strict evaluation by, by a specific institution, uh, the Institute of Luxembourg, um, that evaluates if they are uh, good enough uh, to represent our cultural identity. Uh, so uh, coming to our uh, project, uh, the project was born because the European uh, Union wants to protect, conserve and restore its cultural heritage. And in particular, we 
focused on a typical uh, cultural heritage that is the silk um, cultural heritage. And we involved uh, seven European countries uh, uh, that had in the past a very big tradition about silk, uh, Italy, Greece, Bulgaria, Slovenia, Spain and Georgia, and also France, France is uh, missed. Um, and we have uh, a, a public and a private uh, partnership uh, so that we have a public organization, a research organization, we have a cultural association and also small and medium industries. The overall budget is about 3 million euros and the project lasts uh, um, three years. And uh, we have uh, about uh, 14 participants uh, uh, in the form of partners and uh, associated uh, partners. Um, the overall uh, goal of this project uh, is uh, to create a silk innovation ecosystem. So we want to start from the historical uh, roots of production and commercialization of silk in Europe across ages. Uh, but we wanted to uh, build uh, um, an European silk route as a cultural itinerary, but also an European identity our, around the silk uh, cultural heritage. And in addition, uh, uh, the most important th thing for us, the most important aim is to stop the loss of technical tradition and cultural know-how and skills. As Daphne pointed out before, it is very important that there is a passage between generations. If uh, the silk production um, uh, loses importance in Europe, we have to uh, preserve the cultural heritage of this production, the, the, the meaning uh, it had in the past. And also the project scheme is quite um, innovative. In fact, we have an exploration phase and we have a co-creation and exploitation phase. And though in the, uh, the two phases are uh, planned to um, involve uh, actively uh, the uh, territories and the communities. In particular, in the exploration phase, uh, we want to collect data about the silk cultural heritage in all the countries involved in the project. You know that if you want to protect and preserve something, you have to know it. For this reason, we have, first of all, we have to know in which, uh, which is the, uh, uh, extension and the, the dimension of our uh, cultural heritage about silk. So the first research will be in uh, uh, across pro uh, publication and, and uh, archives, historical archives. But uh, we want also, in the, in the, we uh, believe very much in the bottom-up collection of documents involving uh, schools and museums uh, working with uh, uh, visitors and uh, teachers of schools. We want to map the relevant architectonical and natural uh, sites we have in Europe linked to silk. And uh, we want to have uh, the, this uh, uh, generational passage uh, transmission with interview with stakeholders. Stakeholders uh, who worked in the silk sector in the past and also um, actual uh, current stakeholders, for example, silk industries. Uh, in addition, as uh, um, uh, Daphne said before, that also genetic resources are, and knowledge about uh, genetic resources are part of uh, the cultural heritage. We wanted to um, identify and uh, 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 make a list of uh, Bombix Mori local strains and ancient mulberries. And uh, we wanted to work on that uh, with a cultural and creative uh, uh, industries activity and make a dissemination of what we find on the territory. 
Uh, so we'll uh, uh, begin uh, to collect uh, uh, data um, uh, with schools and uh, we also um, plan to make it as a game. In fact, the, the uh, most uh, um, active schools will be uh, uh, will present their work in a kind of competition, international competition, and they will be invited uh, to uh, one of uh, the Silk Museum uh, to visit uh, the museum and to learn, because it is impo important this factor of learning from uh, new generation. In addition, we want to identify uh, ancient mulberry trees to build a phylogenetic tree and uh, to uh, and to trace the plant's route, the mulberry route from Asia to Europe. And we want also to uh, select local pure silk strain to recreate the typical silk production. We don't want to have the same kind of silk in uh, France and in Spanish and in Greece. We want to have local strains producing local silk with different characteristics to make different kind of textiles, because this is very important for the uh, touristic, uh, um, for uh, the tourism to have different uh, uh, productions, different uh, art um, uh, expression in different uh, uh, territories. And uh, we want also to involve schools, but uh, uh, making uh, them going out of their classroom and going on the territory because the first thing is that uh, students can know what uh, uh, there is in the territory with their uh, teachers and uh, we want also to involve the new generation and the old generations to make an exchange here you can see uh, an old woman uh, in the southern part of italy uh, making uh, an artisanal uh, process of silk uh, um, uh, preparation and uh, uh, here you can see the uh, young children rearing the silkworms and uh, this is very important uh, uh, the um, e exchange among uh, generation then we want that uh, the students report on a map and on a timeline what they uh, find on the territory to uh, contribute to make a bigger map uh, that will be integrated in a virtual map uh, for uh, the uh, that, that will be a final result of our uh, of our project and this is also very important because through modern digital technologies we uh, will uh, exploit uh, the uh, cultural heritage and this uh, um, uh, this uh, uh, the, uh, working together on this matter is uh, very very important. But uh, as we want to be very sound, uh, we want also to uh, may, uh, to compare what we find on the territory and what we find through the scientific research made by historians in the archives. And we want to make a synthesis about that to be sure that what we write and the results of the project are validated from a scientific point of view so that we uh, transmit uh, sound uh, values and experience to people visiting Europe. The same we will do for the Mulberry. We uh, plan to have uh, uh, students going the territories, uh, going the countryside and taking photos on uh, of the uh, wild Mulberries and uh, uh, uploading this photo on an uh, app uh, prepared uh, for the case by one of our partners and then transmitting these uh, photos to us and study and signaling what there is uh, on the territory uh, to the scientists.
Then, uh, after this uh, identification, uh, the scientists will go out and uh, um, uh, choose the most important uh, uh, trees, the most uh, the oldest trees, and make uh, a genetic identification to reconstruct the uh, phylogenesis of uh, the mulberry trees um, and uh, how it was imported uh, in, uh, in Europe, which is uh, the route the tree uh, followed in uh, coming to Europe. But which is the final aim? Because we have a final aim. The, the, the final aim is to plant new mulberry fields with all the varieties involving farmers uh, so that uh, we can uh, rebuild uh, this uh, genetic asset and use it uh, for uh, economic exploitation. The same for the silkworm, because we want to have a typical strain. You can see here a zebra silkworm that is different from the traditional silkworm, but it is a typical expression of one uh, territory. This is a, a collection of our uh, silkworm and uh, cocoons. You see how they are different, how uh, they are a part of uh, a very um, a wide genetic expression. Uh, another uh, aim of this first part of the work will be uh, the construction of a narrative catalog where we will uh, put all uh, the um, relevant units for silk linked to silk for each country and uh, we will uh, give a brief descri description of them. Uh, the second phase uh, will be uh, the um, construction of a virtual model for the European Silk Route, but also the, um, the uh, exploitation of uh, the data we found in the first phase for uh, cultural and creative uh, industries activity. And of course, the dissemination of the achieved uh, results. Uh, so that uh, we will build this virtual map, but also we will have a virtual exhibition of uh, the uh, production of cultural and creative industries. And uh, also we will want, we, we want to um, work with these cultural and creative industries to make their business profitable so that uh, we will uh, implement innovative business and governance models. And we will extend the experience of uh, an already existing local silk itinerary, the French itinerary in the Cévennes. Um, so that uh, um, at, at the end, um, we will uh, uh, design a virtual silk uh, route that could be uh, um, uh, accessible from uh, the mobile uh, um, uh, to have an interaction with, uh, for end users, school association, but also uh, tourists. Uh, we want to analyze uh, the relationship between silk society and history, but to use this association to have a new um, inspiration for design of new patterns and also for digital printing and also to uh, design innovative object, uh, for example, non uh, woven silk and also have uh, um, textiles made of uh, recycled silk cloth. But and also there is a part of research on silk constituents like fibrin and sericin for the design of new uh, material. And this is in compliance with the circul circular economy paradigm. You remember I told you that we want a green um, uh, exploitation of our uh, cultural heritage. This is our example of what uh, we are uh, uh, going to uh, obtain, uh, jewels in silk and uh, gold, uh, accessories for uh, the, the 
ha for houses, uh, um, bags, uh, and uh, other kind of uh, textile, more traditional textiles. Um, so, Sylvia, excuse me, sorry to interrupt you, but uh, we are running uh, a little hour. Okay, so that I will go directly to the virtual map. This is uh, our virtual map as we want to, uh, to, build, uh, to build it. And, uh, uh, and then uh, we wanted to create a European Silk Route uh, in the uh, European part of uh, um, the continent. Uh, I will uh, go very rapidly to the uh, concept the European community wants to transmit, uh, uh, that is the open science, so that our results will be available for all the scientific community in Europe and outside Europe. This is very important because, yes, we want to protect our intellectual property, but at the same time, we want to make it as open as possible and as close as necessary. And the expected uh, outcomes are, uh, um, I have already uh, told you something, but uh, um, I think that the I, we can go to the end. Um, I think the, uh, the most important outcome outcome is to raise the uh, awareness among stakeholders to create an association that could take care of this uh, uh, silk route in, uh, in Europe uh, to e exploit the uh, silk heritage and to attract tourism to uh, Europe about uh, uh, silk. And uh, that could also be important for the um, re uh, rebirth of the silk, uh, the silk industry. And the partners are uh, listed here. So uh, sorry to, for uh, being a lot uh, long, <laughs> but uh, it is very important for me, this project, so that I, I put a lot of passion <laughs> in describing it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. It was an excellent presentation. I mean, very interesting, and it's such an ambitious project. I, I, I hope it's really successful. Um, we have uh, some questions. Um, I have a, a first a question for Daphne. Um, how could WIPO, when creating a sui generis IP protection for TCEs and TK, take into account the experience garnered by UNESCO in intangible cultural heritage safeguarding? For instance, the definition of a community of bearers and practitioners of intangible, intangible cultural heritage may coincide with the potential beneficiaries of an IP protection. Thank you, and, and thank you to Ms. Martina for, for the question. Um, I, I think um, WIPO and UNESCO work on cultural heritage slash traditional cultural expressions, um, which is very similar subject matter, and we work on them from a slightly different angle. So um, WIPO's angle will mainly be the protection of traditional cultural expressions against misuse and misappropriation. And by doing that, incidentally, that can result in, in safeguarding and preservation, which are the main one of the angles uh, of UNESCO. So I think that the two go together and obviously we should, we should look at them also together because there are different pieces of the same puzzle. And, and both angles are important. Um, as, as to your specific example, I, I think it's a good example. Um, I think that the IGC has, uh, you know, kept an eye on uh, UNESCO work and a lot of the delegates and experts that do come in the IGC, they also follow, they also follow UNESCO's work. There have been some references in discussion, but I think the IGC has then you know, um, has its own discussion on some of the issues, like, for example, how do you identify who should be the beneficiaries? And, and, and like I said before, um, the member states agree to say that indigenous peoples and local communities should be beneficiaries. They don't go necessarily further in defining 
who are indigenous peoples and local communities. I think they leave it at that, but the discussion is mainly then on uh, should there be additional beneficiaries other than indigenous peoples and local communities in some countries, say, for example, well, nations should be beneficiaries as well, because in some countries they say, well, maybe they say we don't have uh, indigenous peoples as such, even though we, we do have cultural expressions. And what about those? You know, could they benefit in the same way? And, and these are, you know, the types of discussions that have been taking place um, around beneficiaries. So I hope uh, that answers your question. Thank you, Daphne. And, and Sylvia, uh, one for you. Which is the overall situation of the silk cultural heritage in Europe? And why was this project necessary to preserve it? Okay, uh, you know that uh, we have in Europe uh, a very important uh, silk uh, industry. Uh, for example, in the first uh, semester of uh, 2022, uh, the, um, the export uh, to other uh, countries, uh, the export of silk abroad was uh, around uh, 400 millions of uh, euros. But however, uh, we don't have uh, silk production in this moment in, um, in Europe. We have only, only the final, uh, final step. We don't have cocoon production. We have only uh, silk textile production. For this reason, there is uh, an urgent need uh, to uh, preserve the knowledge about uh, uh, the, the first uh, uh, part of the process and uh, also the genetic resources, uh, uh, I mean uh, the uh, silkworm and uh, mulberry. Uh, if not, uh, uh, on the long term, we will lose uh, any knowledge and uh, genetic resources. Thank you. Well, um, this has been a very interesting uh, webinar. We are with, we are concluding now. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sylvia, Daphne, for uh, this uh, great presentations. And uh, and well, we are concluding our, our last webinar of this um, AIPPI and ACP series. Um, we take the opportunity to invite you to participate in our next uh, events, uh, the IIPPI World Congress in Istanbul, which is going to take place in October uh, this year. And there is going to be a panel uh, for I mean, our committee are, are going to have a panel on these topics. So we invite you to participate and also to um, go attend the ACP Congress in December in Mexico, uh, which will be also, uh, I mean, it's a great forum uh, to discuss IP issues. So thank you all um, and have a good day. Goodbye.